Well, we have a lot to talk about this week. There was a small event last week. If uh, my sound sign sounds kind of hollow, I'm back in Costa Rica working on my laptop. I forgot my external microphone, so I uh, am leaning into my, my laptop microphone as much as I possibly can. Then I'm going to try to clean it up uh, in Final Cut Pro, see if I can't get it to you. Let's go through the uh, economic calendar. We'll uh, hit the Fed on the next page, and uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, on Monday, uh, New York Empire State Manufacturing. Uh, the regionals this week, this past week, we had a, a few regionals, and we got uh, a bunch of regionals coming up this week, starting to show some life. 11.5, previous was negative 4.7. Um, and on one of the regionals, we'll look a, a little into... Uh, the detail, and it uh, looks like it's the wrong indexes that are pulling this up, but let's just keep this in mind, 11.5. <clears throat> Canada, inflation rate, uh, which um, sets the Bank of Canada up for another cut at the next meeting. Look at the year over year. This is headline year over year, 2%. Last reading was 2.5. We're at 2%. The core, 1.5%, uh, down from one7 <clears throat> this is on a year-over-year -year basis, and uh, month over month, certainly not what any central bank wants to see, which is deflation. Uh, inflation rate month over month, negative 0.2. Last month was plus 0.4, and the core, negative 0.1. A uh, month before was 0.3, so you, on a monthly basis, are flirting with deflation. Now, I mean, one... One data point isn't isn't going to make a trend, but you're flirting with deflation here. You're at your target on your headline, and your core is well below. Shelter, 5.3. Uh, looking at some of the components, 5.3 versus 5.7 in July. So that was a nice step down. When we look at the year over year, what's still keeping it at 2%? Why is it not lower? Mortgage interest costs up 18.8% year over year. Rent up 8.9% year over year. Auto insurance up 9.1% year over year. Um, food and energy, everyone's got to pay for that. That's in uh, headline. Uh, auto insurance. Uh, if you have a car, it is law. You must you must have auto insurance. That's up 9.1%. Uh, if you have a house and a mortgage, which most people have a mortgage, 18.8% uh, on your mortgage interest cost. You have no choice but to pay that. And if you don't have a house, uh, uh, other than just owning your house free and clear, if you don't have a house, you're renting up 8.9%. These are things that are unavoidable. Um Clothing and footwear down 4.4%. This is month over month, down 4.4% month over month. Household operations, furnishing and equipment down 0.8%. And this is the case I've been making for quite some time. Technology is deflationary. Digital computing equipment and devices down 10.1% year over year, quite common. If you expect uh, the, uh, uh, the digital world to become a bigger and bigger part of everyday life, uh, the backdrop in advanced economies, I'm not going to say in emerging economies because they have different economics, but in advanced economies, the backdrop is deflation. I still hold tight to the uh, reality in my mind that central banks are going back to the zero line. They will have, I think, little choice. <clears throat> Whoops, I uh, changed the size of the screen on you there. Let's get it back. Retail sales. Uh, for the U.S., 0.1% uh, in August, uh, up 0.1%. Uh, the previous month, 1% uh, was upgraded to 1.1% or revised to 1.1%. Retail sales X autos, 0.1%. So this is seasonally adjusted. What this is saying is that the uh, sale of autos in August showed no, no deviation from its seasonal pattern the year before. It was pretty much the same. Uh, that's how you get these two numbers the same. X gas up 0.2 and year over year up 2.1%. Uh, the previous year upgraded to 2.9 uh, or revised up to 2.9 from 2.7. So still you got a C, a consumer, that still seems like it's still in the game because you're talking about an increase over July. And July was an increase uh, over June, right? Great Britain, UK. Inflation rate, this will, we'll, uh, we'll look at 
uh, a bunch of central bank decisions on uh, on the next screen. We'll understand the UK a little bit better. Uh, year over year flat, but look at uh, look at the uh, other measures. Core year over year three point six. Uh, previous was three point three. The consensus was three five. The inflation rate month over month. These are the year over years. Here's the month over month. Headline month over month point three up from negative point two. And core, 0.4, uh, the previous month was 0.1. So these came in hotter, uh, significantly hotter than expected. And we will see on the next screen uh, on the interest rate decision, and they made no change. Wednesday morning, oil inventories um, down 1.63 million barrels. Previous uh, was a build. The consensus was down, but only 100,000. Uh, gasoline stocks call that flat, up 69,000 barrels. Uh, previous was an increase of 2.3, uh, 2.31 million, and the consensus was a build uh, of 610,000, and it was 69,000. Here is a chart <clears throat> uh, for weekly Cushing, Oklahoma, ending stocks, excluding the strategic petroleum reserves because they're not available to be dispersed. Um, this is from the uh, EIA short-term energy outlook, and it just charts inventory levels. And I've overlaid some prices over here. So when uh, uh, over here, when you had the low, this is when oil prices were just increasing, hit $90 a barrel, and then supply just started exploding, and that prices fell to $40 or $50 a barrel. Uh, prices started to increase. Inventories were drawn down. Price here was 65. Price here is 39. This price in this range in here was 70 to 90. We're sitting at 71.25, but you can see uh, where the price range was previous. Uh, you know, this was 65 up from 40 to 50. This was 90. Uh, so with inventory where it is, the price of WTI seems consistent with that price. So the, the calls for 65, 60, 55, 50 dollar oil at these inventory levels don't really seem to be supported. Not only that, the short term outlook from the EIA says for the second half of 24 and even the first half of 25, prices uh, seem well supported in this region. Only going after uh, this date do they see uh, supply increasing faster than demand. Uh, so, according to their short-term outlook for the next four quarters, well, the next three quarters really, because we only have one quarter left in 24, uh, that the uh, there's still a drawdown in um, <clears throat> inventory stocks globally because OPEC Plus is still keeping their uh, oil cuts in place till, till December. And once they uh, start increasing their output, if they do, you have to rebuild those inventory stocks. And that's why they're saying, you know, second half, of uh, 2025, yeah, you could you could see uh, oil supply exceeding oil demand, and there's where we we get some pressure. But uh, given given the low level of inventory, it is consistent. The price is consistent with with uh, where it is. Moving on to the Fed, 50 basis points. I did not expect that. I had uh, put some uh, you can call them casino bets in place. For 25, I used the October. <clears throat> I, I used a, a sort of a, uh, I'll explain, I used an October, I used a January, I used an April, and I used a July ZQ. This was just a straight bet because the, there was no, there is no time for that to adjust. If the Fed would move 50, uh, the October uh, ZQ would go to 90. Uh, 95.17 to 18. Uh, and if it uh, only went 25, it would go to 94.92. Uh, so it was a binary outcome. Normally I don't make binary bets like that, but I did. And I laddered them. Uh, I think I did uh, four, five, five, seven uh, in terms of contracts. Uh, lost, lost. Gained a little, gained a lot. This here uh, was a nice one, and I had seven of those, so I had heavier weighting on the back end. So I had gone into the Fed meeting 
uh, all of these contracts were up a total of 7,700. I could have just taken the 7,700 and walked away, but you know, I felt I was absolutely right and I was absolutely wrong. Uh, I walked away with a gain. I think it was around in the 11 to 1300 range, somewhere in there. Um, so, you know, pride, right? I thought for sure I was right. But you go back to July, I thought for sure uh, that the Fed should have cut 50, 25 basis points at that time. Uh, so I've had two wrong in a row. Maybe the 50 here is like, yeah, you were right, Mark. We should have cut 25 in July, and we should have cut 25 here. You're right on the 25, but we're just going to go 50 and, and make, you, <laughs> make you right on both. That's my interpretation, and I'm sticking with it. Um, what was nice is the long end of the curve didn't react the same way as the front end of the curve. The, uh, I had sold calls on TLT at 101. Uh, those who have the uh, uh, positions video in the applied level uh, know uh, I had reported on that a few weeks ago. And uh, TLT uh, certainly dropped uh, below 98. The 101s well uh, are paying out nice and well. I had also the 101, uh, the 100 September uh, puts, long the puts, and I had shorted an October 105 uh, call to get that done. That paid off nicely as well. Closed that out, sold $100 puts. Uh, for October uh, on TLT, uh, and I still have a lot of U.S. Treasuries, uh, so those are, are are working out fine. I have uh, no desire to get out of my Treasuries, uh, and I have uh, no desire to uh, lower the TLT position. In fact, I don't mind increasing the TLT position because I do believe uh, that over the next couple of years, regardless of who wins the White House, it will become obvious that the zero line is the only place to go because uh, digital, a digital world is deflationary and a deficit and increasing debt world uh, is expensive. Uh, you, you will, those two forces alone, uh, we're going back to the zero line. TLT will eventually find its way uh, back to the levels it was before all this started, which is around the $160 mark. Uh, I'm not budging. I'm not moving on my positions uh, on those ones. So 50 basis points. Let's have a look at the summary of economic projections in here. Look at change in GDP only from the June projection. Really uh, uh, just a little bit of a drop from 2.1 to 2. Everything else is the same, mostly unchanged. Uh, if we, uh, so you, you could think, well, that doesn't justify 50. If, if if you didn't move in July and you're expecting just a little thing, I'm, I'm not finding the 50 basis points in here. Unemployment rate from 4 to 4.4, from 4.2 to 4.4, 4.1 4 to 4.3, mostly higher. And I think that is where they ran to, uh, along with, you know, oh, the Somme rule is being triggered, even though Claudia Somme has said it wasn't designed for this type of environment, and no, we're not in a recession, and technically it hasn't been triggered. They, uh, they, they beg to disagree. Uh, look at inflation, 2.6 to 2.3, 2.3 to 2.1, uh, mostly lower. So uh, GDP relatively unchanged, inflation mostly lower, unemployment mostly higher, but certainly not at emergency levels, but they went... 50 on this one. Uh, I think they are also aware uh, of, you know, the two big points I'm saying is that we live in a deflationary world. Deflation is, or disinflation is well on its way. I think their bigger, bigger problem later on is going to be deflation. And the realization that no matter who wins this thing, uh, the interest cost is already a trillion a year, one trillion a year just in interest. The interest cost is going to uh, become unaffordable if we keep these rates elevated. We have to we have to lower them. Maybe there was some thinking there. I'm certain, sure they're not going to come out and say that. Fed funds rate um, by the end of the year, 4.4 uh, in June, 5.1. That implies two more uh, 25 basis point cuts. Uh, market is pricing in three more at this point. Uh, and at the end of 2025, 3.4 down from 4.1, uh, that is 100 in 2025. To get from 4.4 to 3.4 is 100 more, 100 more points. Uh, and then 2.9 by the end of 26, 50 basis points in 2026. They're ending at 2.9. Is that 
Is that our star? Is that where they think our star is? It's important to point out uh, that if you go back and look at all of the summary of economic projections since the start of this thing, the Fed has been mostly, and when I say mostly, 90% has been mostly wrong. Mostly wrong based on what they thought versus what actually was the outcome at the time of their next meeting. They've been uh, mostly wrong. So all of this stuff that they're presenting here is, well, I mean, that's their opinion, but it's, it's 19 people and they've been mostly wrong. Other central banks, Brazil, increased their rates 25 basis points uh, the same day as the Fed later on that night, Brazil. Uh, 25 basis points to 10.75 percent. Saudi Arabia matched the U.S. a drop of 50 basis points to 5.5. Turkey, no change, still sitting at 50 percent. Just, just, just take that in for a minute. 50 percent. The U.K., no change, 5 percent. But we saw its uh, inflation numbers, and it's probably the right move. Uh, South Africa, drop of 25 basis points down to 8%. Bank of Japan, no move, staying at 0.25. I didn't think that they were going to make a move. They're talking the yen. They're talking uh, uh, the, the yen up in strength. Um, I think they have to. But given the sheer amount of their debt, they, 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 cannot, they cannot make that debt more expensive at this point. Now, it wouldn't make all the debt more expensive. It would make newer debt more expensive. But just the sheer amount of debt in relation to the size of their economy, uh, you cannot you cannot make it more expensive. And while I'm on that topic about debt versus the size of the economy, uh, I just listened to a podcast with Mohammed El Arian, uh, and it was uh, All LC, the All Else Equal podcast. Two professors on there, one from Wharton, one from Stanford, saying that if you're looking at debt to GDP, uh, you, really can't, you really can't look at that because this is a stock variable and this is a flow variable. Uh, and that has been going up over time. So they say if you look at debt to the uh, equity market or debt to the value of housing, it's been basically flat. Uh, it's kind of concluding, you know, academics, right? Concluding that debt's not a problem. If we conclude that, then we must say, well, then housing is not unaffordable. There is no shortage of housing, and housing is not unaffordable. But if you say, well, housing is ridiculously unaffordable, then that means debt has you know, significantly gone up. Now, the big problem I have with using flow uh, stock over stock as opposed to just using stock over flow, the big problem I have is this is a taxable number. This is not taxable. This is not taxable. And you have to pay back this debt, so you want to compare it to a taxable number. Besides, you can always do 112th January's debt plus 112th of February's debt, blah, blah, blah. You can weight it, and you can come up with a quasi-flow measure. But leave it to academics to make things way more complicated than it needs to be. Uh, and showing how smart they are by looking at a whole bunch of other things, you know, stuff that I call academic masturbation. The debt to GDP is a good measure. Uh, yes, it's a stock over a flow, but you can change the stock by looking at averages. We do this in financial analysis all the time. If we have ROE, what is that? That is return, uh, which is our net income, whatever that is. That's a flow variable over equity, but we use average, right? Average equity, average assets. We turn it into a quasi-flow variable, and that is well accepted in the world of finance. So uh, you must be an academic to twist yourself up in a pretzel uh, to make a point. And the beautiful thing about data is you can make any point you want. You can make any point you want. In a complex system uh, that has no solution, you can tell, there's data available to tell any story you want. You just have to ignore other data, but there's always data. If you want to say that uh, we never once had inflation, there is data to say we never once had inflation. If you want to say we're in a recession now and we've been in recession for 18 years, I guarantee you there's data to show you that. That's the thing about complex systems is the data is available to back up any story you want. And why? Because complex systems have no solutions. And since they have no solutions, this is what they have. They have data that will say it's this. They have data that will say whatever crazy theory you have, there's data to back it up. Uh, but 
uh, for those that are trying to discourage you from using debt to GDP. It is the best one to use because GDP is the taxable component in all this, and you do, contrary to modern monetary theory, you do have to pay that back. It does matter. Okay, let's uh, just, uh, with the Fed behind us here, let's have a look at uh, gold. Uh, there's the Fed decision right in here. You can see the wild reaction, they shoot up in price and then they move straight down and then they slow move up uh, in price to all time highs. Uh, there is only one gold. You can't, uh, you know, you can't have uh, uh, an initial gold offering. Uh, uh, and have every company out there and every individual and every crazy idea issue gold. It, there is only one gold. It is a real asset. And uh, I continue to favor gold miners, especially uh, Newmont. Um, I don't think that 3000 on gold is unrealistic. And if we go out to 2045, if you jump ahead, uh, even 2035, but I go to 2045, I don't think 15,000 is unrealistic uh, on gold uh, because the, the um, yield per ore has been decreasing. All the Tier 1 mines have been found. There, there probably are no Tier 1 gold deposits left. Uh, so reserves, if you need to get uh, resources, there are lots of gold resources out there, but resources are uneconomical. Uh, once they become, as the price increases, these resources turn into reserves. And reserves are economical to mine. You've got to get the price up significantly if you're going to get uh, the continuing supply of gold up. With uh, advanced economies around the world having financed most of their growth through their history with debt and now addicted to it to the point where they cannot quit, we do have addicts. They are addicted to debt. No government will cut debt because they want to, or, or cut spending because they want to get reelected. The uh, the tax revenue is now their reelection uh, uh, is their reelection budget. And you get this, and you get look how much money everybody wants to give away every day. They're announcing more and more giveaways, more and more free stuff, more and more free stuff. Debt is going to Japanese style levels. You think 120 percent of GDP in the U.S. is uh, unrealistic. Uh, wait till 2035 when it's 160 percent. Now I know the Congressional Budget Office is not calling for that. They're calling for debt to continually to increase over time. But in their forecasts over the next 10 years, they have no recession where debt tends to spike before the, the uh, debt issuance comes back down. They're not including uh, the spike in there. Uh, you're, going to, you're going to have to run to someplace safe. And uh, after the Fed announcement, gold is showing itself to be the, uh, the target of choice. Here is Bitcoin. For those of you thinking uh, about Bitcoin, keep in mind, gold is at all-time highs and there's only one gold. And the economics of gold are fairly straightforward. Uh, but Bitcoin, these are digital assets. They're zeros and ones. Uh, and it, is, it ran up as well, but it is well below all-time highs. Gold hitting all-time highs. Bitcoin not hitting all-time highs. Uh, and there is an unlimited number of limited coins. There are literally thousands of, of digital uh, coins out there, literally thousands of them. There is no shortage of digital assets, no shortage at all. Uh, and if, there is, if the price goes up, it just encourages more ICOs, initial coin offerings. But you cannot have an IGO. There is no initial gold offering. There's only one. So if you are looking, if you are concerned about the level of debt, if you're concerned about uh, how inflationary uh, all of that debt will be along with lower rates, if you're concerned about the next round of bubbles, gold is where you want to be, not Bitcoin. Uh, gold is where you want to be. Moving into Thursday, initial jobless claims, 219, quite low. Previous was 231. And uh, hop down the line, continuing claims, uh, 1,829,000 down from 1,843,000. Another regional, Philly Fed, 1.7. Previous was 7. Look at some of the sub-indexes here. CapEx, willing to spend more. Uh, employment, willing to hire more. New orders, not so much. No, new orders, nothing to see here, and we're going to pay a lot more. This is, uh, this is, 
not very good. And it might be that the expansion on this, usually if you have prices being paid, you have some kind of expansionary pressure, uh, which would lead to an expansion in the index. This is the wrong way to get your expansion. This would be the right way to get your expansion. These are backwards. All right, and uh, the new orders doesn't support CapEx or employment. So I think there's still some issues in the measurement of what it is they're trying to measure. Leading index, negative 0.2, but uh, previous month was negative 0.6. Inflation rate, remember Japan decided we're not going anywhere. UK's uh, decided also we're not going anywhere, but their inflation was elevated. Let's see if uh, what we have in Japan. Here's the year over year. 3% up from 2.8. Core, 2.8 up from 2.7. So sort of uh, like the UK going in the wrong direction. Let's look at the, um, uh, the oh, sorry, this is a year over year. Inflation month over month, 0.5 up from 0.2. Uh, so raising rates for Japan would have seemed like the thing to do, much like the UK. Uh, they didn't lower rates because inflation is a bit of a problem, but they already have elevated rates. Japan already has very, very low rates and inflation increased and they didn't raise it, which uh, just uh, for me is backs up my, my thinking that the tough talk coming out of the Bank of Japan was for the yen's purpose. And if the uh, yen is going to be used as a carry trade, why have a negative interest rate? Why not just go on the other side of the zero line of small move, but go on the other side? But I don't think, I don't think uh, that this bank is willing to uh, increase its interest rate given the level of debt. However, I have been wrong on central banks before. I don't know when. I can't recall the last time I was wrong. <laughs> but uh, based on, on, on my thinking now and what I think, I, I, can't, I can't see a good reason. If it were me, I couldn't see a good reason to increase the interest rate given the level of debt. Given that I do have a shrinking population, I would seem to think the inflation would take care of itself. If only I could get a little bit more strength in the yen, I know what I'll do. I'll threaten and, and uh, you know, see how long I can get away with that. Long enough for uh, interest rate differentials uh, to decrease uh, because I'm probably thinking the same thing, uh, uh, you know, that, that if I'm at zero and I'm having a hard time given my level of debt, all these other countries, the debt's increasing, they're going to have that same realization and um, interest rate differentials will, will decrease over time. I just need to buy myself some time. I think that's what BOJ is doing. Canada, uh, retail sales, first uh, two lines up here, 0.4. And uh, 0.9, that's not bad. This is uh, month over month uh, from July, 0.9. So retail sales, there's the consumer coming along, not bad. PPI, uh, negative 0.8, uh, that is month over month in deflation, year over year, almost uh, negligible from 2.8 down to 0.2. Remember, PPI is just the other side of CPI, right? You're just on the other side of the counter. Raw material prices month over month for August, negative 3.1. Raw material prices year over year, negative 2.5. Uh, so that is backing up some of the earlier numbers with CPI we saw in deflation. PPI is uh, singing the same song. Remember, PPI, you're sitting, here's the sales counter. There's the consumer. Uh, and what the consumer hands over the counter will be CPI. What the, uh, the, the, this person receives over here will be PPI. It's just the opposite side. CPI said we have negative numbers month over month. PPI says we have negative numbers over month. There's confirmation. Okay. Rates and yields, money market rates, uh, all below 5% now. 5% is gone, 4.89. Effective federal funds rate is 4.83, sitting just slightly above that on the one month. Uh, and on the long end of the curve, we had an increase week over week. After we got the 50 basis points, the long end said, you know, maybe we've gone a little bit too far. I had sold calls on ZB. And that worked out well. I had sold calls on TLT. That worked out well. My ZQ over here from March, sorry, from April and really July worked out. My uh, October and January took a loss and uh, egg on my face with 50 instead of 25. After being adamant 
that this Fed did not seem like a 25 basis point Fed. Although in, 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 in some solace during the press conference, Powell said that had they had some information uh, at the July meeting, they would have cut at the July meeting, which I thought they would cut at the July meeting. So they were, I was right, they were wrong. How's that sound? I was right, they should have cut 25 in July, 25 in September. They realized they were wrong. They heard about me, they said that Meldrum guy was right. We should have cut 25 and 25. Let's just do 50 and make him really right. So in essence, maybe I was right all along. Maybe I wasn't wrong at all. See, if you were an academic, you could twist yourself up in a pretzel like that and make whatever case you want. Uh, the slope, remember now we've stopped with this, right? That was, uh, the, that was a record, by the way, for the two to the 10 uh, in terms of duration. Uh, actually, no, no, hang on, no, no, I don't think it was a record. I think there was one that was longer. I take that back. It's a record down here, but I don't think it was a record for the capital market curve. I don't think it was. I don't know. Uh, anyways, uh, Canada is uh, now uh, upward sloping, not by one basis point yet, 0.9 basis points, but still, uh, there we are, 0.9. Uh, this is this is 14 basis points. The way it's written in Canada is they, they write the basis points full out like 111.5 versus negative 107. That's 107 basis points. That's 111 basis points. That's 0.9. That is 14. Uh, but the curve steepened all along the way. Curvature coming out again, uh, negative 19. Balance sheet is down, well, a little bit. Uh, most of it was the securities runoff, but uh, net of another 660 million down to 7.109 trillion. Uh, are we gonna see a six on the full balance sheet soon? Uh, look at this finally, right? Squeezing some money out of uh, money market funds, but we've seen this before where it increases, 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 and then you have a somewhat decrease, and then it just starts increasing again. So. Let's see if this is a trend, if the decrease is a trend. Retail still increasing, $5 billion, uh, both in government and prime. And institutions down $25 billion, both in government and prime. Uh, and reverse repo, we'll see on the next screen, really increased as well. So this might have to do uh, with, um, uh, since this is more institutional, it might have to do with uh, balance sheet money uh, that's moving out of these funds and, and being prepared for the end of quarter. Uh, for uh, probably uh, um, liquidity reasons or for uh, tax installment reasons. Okay, next FOMC, 46 days away. Slight delay on this one because uh, of the election. So they will know the result. Well, <laughs> we the belief is they will know the, the, the election will have been held. Will they know the result of the election? That's, that's going to be the tough one. Uh, but the election will have been held uh, by the time they get to their next meeting so they can avoid all charges of being political on this one. 50-50 uh, on going uh, 25 versus another 50. Uh, in one day, S&P PMI, actually, while we're on, it, let's just go out to December here. Uh, there is uh, going to be, or at least the market is thinking, minimum is four cuts or more. Uh, the idea of only three is not really in there because that would just be one more cut. They lead off with 50. It seems that they would go 25 and 25. Uh, that bet is 26.3%, 50% that it's going to be another 50 and a 25 to get the 4.25. Uh, Monday, S&P PMIs, they're not as uh, important uh, um, although they, they are reported, but they're not as market moving. Um, RBA rate decision, uh, Australia in two days, Swiss National Bank rate decision uh, in four days. Uh, US GDP for Q2, the final look, uh, and durable goods in four days, uh, Japan CPI in four days, and then Friday US PCE. Uh, and Canadian GDP for July, the second look at uh, July GDP, or I think final look at July GDP. Uh, Monday, Bostic, Goolsby, and Kashkari. Tuesday, Bank of Canada, we have Tiff Macklem speaking. Thursday, Powell, Williams, Barr, and Kashkari. Just in case you didn't hear him on Monday, he'll repeat himself again on Thursday. Look at, look at, look at. 
effective federal funds rate 4.83 percent reverse repo up 54 billion uh, on the previous screen I said we that, that the move in the money market from in the institutional side could be maybe some maneuvering from corporate balance sheets but it, you know it's not the end of the month yet uh, it's the 22nd today which means they still have they could have done it all this week and so this year combined with the drawdown in uh, in money market funds I don't have an answer for that uh, it's uh, just as a curiosity the lowest level was hit on September 16, 239.386, uh, and then it just increased into the end of the week. TGA up 107 uh, billion, reserves down 142 billion, which leaves repo and reserves less ample at 1.05 trillion. That's what's left, I think, to run off at 40 billion a month right now, 26.4 months to go. Mortgage rates. Look at that, 6.09, threatening a five handle on that one, down 11 basis points. So week over week, the U.S. Treasury is up five, 30-year FRM down 11. Uh, the uh, spread, that should say, down uh, six to 236 basis points. And, of course, the mortgage reach really like that, 1.35, 2.76. Arbor having another good week, 3.73. Gave back quite a bit on Friday, but uh, was over the uh, over fifteen dollars on on Friday morning. Uh, I was looking at that, thinking, okay, nice, nice. I'm in a nice gain on that one. I have the seventeen fifty calls for January, financed by the seven fifty puts in a ratio of forty to one hundred, uh, and that was doing nicely on Friday. Gave back a little on Friday. I didn't find any significant reason for it. IYR, the REITs giving back, uh, makes sense. Long end of the curve actually was uh, higher on Friday than it was on Wednesday. XLU, surprising that it still held in there, but still pulling out a gain on energy. I was watching, and I forget what it was, but it was talking about, uh, oh yeah, it was talking about Dojo, uh, this video talking about uh, the supercomputer uh, that Tesla is building and how much power it is it is it's needing that it's actually creating smog in one of the cities i forget what city it was but they're complaining about the level of the pollution because they fired up some gas uh, natural gas fired turbines to power this place and the u.s seems to be the home of these big supercomputers uh and more of with more of these data centers coming and more of these supercomputers being built uh they talked about the uh, amount of energy that's going to be needed uh, just to power these things. It's unbelievable. And I think utilities uh, might be defying the, uh, the yield curve because usually they're very bond-like in their pricing because their uh, return stream is regulated. At least the return on their uh, equity is regulated. Uh, that it just could be that, that the future growth in assets to meet the demand is is being priced in either way utilities uh, are being a, are a great winner uh, dhi down in sympathy with lennar because they are uh, kind of in the same in the same marketplace uh, order book came in light uh, they had good earnings everything was uh, was uh, decent but their order book came in light and their average selling price came in light as well which you know that doesn't look good going forward uh, all the other home builders still hanging in there. Mortgage apps, uh, look at that. Uh, second big week in a row, up 14.2%. The housing index recovered slightly uh, at, you know, from, it was 39 was the last read. This is 41, still in contraction. Uh, building permits up 4.9%. Housing starts up 9.6%. Existing home sales down 2.5%. Um, it just doesn't, uh, you know, these these numbers here don't seem to support this number here. Uh, Tuesday housing price index in case Scheller we get on July is is that well this is backwards looking but it's pretty much only known one direction new home sales uh, for August we get on Wednesday and pending home sales uh, we get on Thursday and um, OAS all of them decreased. 
big on triple C. Give us the garbage. Give us the garbage. Look at the move on that. 80 basis points uh, contracted 8.63%. Uh, only high, uh, the all of high yield was down, uh, contracted 10%. 34 basis points from 344 down to 310. This is some big moves. Intel, got to pay attention to this one. Look what happened at about 3 p.m. on Friday as it was just sort of drifting away and then just shot right up to over 23. It came back down after some euphoria here. Uh, chip giant Qualcomm uh, made a takeover approach to rival Intel in recent days, according to people familiar with the matter, in what would be one of the largest and most consequential deals in recent years. A deal for Intel which has a market value of roughly 90 billion would come as the chip maker has been suffering through one of the most significant crises in its five decade history. A deal is far from certain, the people cautioned, even if Intel is receptive. A deal of that size is all but certain to attract antitrust scrutiny, though it is also possible it could be seen as an opportunity to strengthen the US's competitive edge in chips to get the deal done, Qualcomm could intend to sell assets or parts of Intel to other buyers. Uh, I had been looking at Intel for the last couple of weeks, deciding whether it is a, a deep value play or a value trap. And I can make arguments on both sides, uh, which means I'm at a 50-50 on this one. Uh, I don't know that this really changes too much. Uh, any any negotiation or any deal would would take quite some time to do, and I don't know that that the the hope or the hype stays in the price. But it is something to be aware of. Uh, when I thought about directions that Intel would take, I saw it as selling some of its assets. I never actually considered that it would be uh, a takeover. Uh, Canada, given its market cap, 90 billion is not a small a small thing to uh, to digest. Um, but here we are. So this bears watching. Let's draw a guy with some eyes going. Oh my God! Let's watch that thing. See, this is this is why I, I think everyone should uh, have at least one fine arts course behind them, so you don't end up doing stuff like that. Friday, uh, FedEx. And they had their uh, earnings um, the night before. 3.6, $3.60. Expectation 476. That is a big miss. Revenue 21.6. Expectation 21.96. Uh, $360 million miss. So uh, based on Thursday's closing to Friday's closing, down 45.75. Uh, and even during the day, in the day before, it hit 305, ended at 250, well, close 255, 50 bucks in there. That's a big down day. From their presentation, Q1 results reflect a challenging demand environment. That's interesting. Particularly in U.S. domestic package market, challenging demand environment, particularly in the U.S. So the post-pandemic boom in online ordering. Uh, coming back to pre-pandemic levels, perhaps, maybe even a little bit lower. Narrowing our uh, fiscal year 25 adjusted EPS outlook to a range of 20 to 21. It was 21 to 22. Looking at the effect, uh, the adjusted operating income, uh, this is a, called a waterfall chart. Uh, if you uh, are going from a... Um, uh, one number to a lower number. In other words, if you're going downwards, you show all your negatives followed by your positive. If you were going the other way, showing how uh, operating earning had increased over the year, you show all your positives followed by your negatives. Uh, revenue, net of cost increases, uh, took off um, 400 million. You, this, uh, this, this is telling here, um, because the U USPS contract, U.S. Postal Service contract expires in Q2. It's not being renewed. Uh, it's a $1.75 billion hit to revenue uh, per year on this one, but <clears throat> it, it, it has no effect. It, it wasn't profitable to begin with. They made that statement in their uh, presentations that this is, it's not even profitable to be in the business with them, so who cares, right? So they're letting that one go. Um, International export yield pressure down uh, 200 million. 
one few fewer operating day, uh, sort of attributing 200 million to that, and then drive up uh, 400 million. Transportation down 25 percent. Revenues from transportation down 25 percent. That is getting it to your door. Freight down nine percent. So uh, all is not well in the earnings in the earnings market. Uh, if we look at uh, at uh, the type of earnings over the last quarter, you've had more companies uh, that have been significantly missing versus what you had, uh, you know, two, three, four quarters ago. This showed up in my uh, inbox earlier in the week. Uh, I subscribe to different websites to get their, uh, their news feeds. And when I got it, it was two weeks to go. Now we're down to eight days. Eight, eight days to stave off supply chain chaos on the U.S. East Coast. Uh, this was known before the Fed meeting. That, uh, that this was a possibility. This was known uh, and, and, and that you are facing the real potential of, of a strike on the U.S. Uh, East Coast for ports. Now, nothing in, nothing out, uh, which will create shortages because you're going to have to have everything sent to the West Coast, which will create uh, congestion. Uh, and it's just going to take a while to, to, to get stuff into the country. That in itself will be inflationary. So that's why, you know, with this Having read this, I thought, oh, for sure they're only going to go 25, but apparently not. With just two weeks left to, uh, to strike a deal, the prospect of 45,000 American dock workers downing tools comes uh, uh, come the start of next month now looks highly likely. Wait till we uh, read some of the things down here. Contract negotiations are broken down between the International Longshoremen's Association and port operators on the U.S. East and Gulf Coast. The current agreement which covers workers at facilities including six of the ten busiest U.S. ports expire September 30th. Harold Daggett, the ILA's president, warned earlier this month in a video uploaded to the union's website, the ILA most definitely will hit the streets on October 1st. Most definitely. The union has been seeking, listen of this, wage increases in excess of 70% plus commitments from terminal operators to avoid automating operations at their facilities. Daggett's son, Dennis, who serves as the union's vice president, yeah, you know, there's a nepotism there, you know. We've had this call for a long time from the elite and from management, uh, uh, calling out nepotism among workers. <laughs> Actually, it's the other way around, all the workers calling out nepotism. But uh, here's the union, and it's his son who serves as the union's vice president. Kind of sounds like a dictatorship where your son gets put in place, right? But uh, unions are socialists, so maybe that's what's going on. Uh, serves as the union's vice president, stressed in a podcast yesterday, in regards to automation or semi-automation. Now, I want you to pay attention to the intelligent statement they're making here. In regards to automation or semi-automation, we're completely against any type of robotic taking over an actual human being's job. No progress here, please. No progress here. Oh, and we want 70% more. Or uh, we are definitely hitting the streets. The rhetoric, man. United States Maritime Alliance. Uh, which represents the port employee, stated last week there was still little sign of the two sides reaching agreement. Well, <laughs> duh, right? A coastwide strike at U.S. East and Gulf Coast ports now looks certain to start on October 1st, 2024. Analysts at Liner Lytica warned in their latest weekly report, uh, and they, uh, they are a uh, research uh, and data provider to the shipping industry. So what's going to happen is all of those ships that are traveling, uh, here's the U.S., we'll just draw it here, here's the East Coast, here's the West Coast, that are, that are heading to the East Coast are going to have to go around the world and head to the uh, West Coast or try to get through the Panama Canal up to here. But Panama Canal has a capacity constraint, so that's not really going to be much of a, a choice. So let's draw South America in here. They're going to have to come around and all the way up. or if goods are coming from China, have to ship it, which they probably already are, to the West Coast, and you have the Christmas season coming up. You get a strike, especially with these demands. We want 70% more money, and we are against any kind of progress whatsoever. We want to stay stuck in the 1920s. 
Uh, we don't want any kind of uh, progress at all. Um, and of course, uh, let's get some nepotism going on here. I mean, do, when they talk, do they, I wonder if they even hear themselves uh, when they talk and step back and say, well, this sounds a little ridiculous, doesn't it? Okay, SPY, uh, September 19th, another all-time high, 570.25. Uh, last week I said there are no triple tops, and there aren't. What we have now, you have one top, two, and then you broke through and closed above it, you now have a double bottom. There are no triple tops, there are no triple bottoms, right? So if you revisit something twice, if we revisit something twice and start heading towards it, at least from a technical Technical perspective, these simple little mantras you like to repeat. 570.25, closed at 568.12, slightly below an all-time high. Forward four-quarter operating earnings, 258.76, down uh, a buck from the week before. <clears throat> SP Global back in the game, but a week late, 257. Gives us 22 times 8, 22.08 uh, times forward earnings. Uh, this is a Q3, Q4 of 24, Q1, Q2 of 25. This is about to drop off and this one uh, come online and earnings look like this quarter over quarter. No one ever forecasts them lower. So you have uh, this one falling off and this one uh, increasing. So you'll have the whole difference between the two showing up in earnings, which would make, you know, once we start earning season, it does make that multiple go down because the front end uh, quarter is falling off and the back end quarter is coming on. Uh, but still, you are paying 22 times forward earnings on this versus 21.65. So, uh, you know, 50 basis points down, you think, well, my money market uh, rate isn't paying that much. Let me get into the equity market only to find out, well, no, uh, the trade-off is you're going to pay more for it. So your rent has increased 5%. Uh, you think you're going to buy a house that has increased in price by 10%. That's your, that's your decision that you have to make. Uh, but keep in mind that uh, we are still hitting all-time highs. Um, <clears throat> you might think, well, you know, interest rates are coming down. Uh, that is going to be a good boost for earnings. But it was not a, uh, when interest rates were going up, it was not a draw on earnings because this is the S&P 500, large cap, investment grade, fixed rate, fixed rate debt, and interest rate uh, uh, caps or swaps in place. They were basically immune from interest rate increases. That means they're going to be immune from interest rate decreases. Interest rate decreases aren't really going to help them. If, if, if interest rate hikes didn't hurt them, we can't make the case that cuts will now help them. It is going to be uh, symmetrical uh, on this one. Uh, implied volatility dropping away as well. Not only are we at all-time highs, uh, but uh, there's nothing to see here. Uh, there is no fear uh, and uh, nothing. You're going to get no premiums on the options either. Earnings this week were in disagreement again. I think this is just a case, uh, just, just a fact of, 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 of this is that uh, they're not going to get the simple things right. But somehow, magically, because they charge a lot of money, they get the hard things right. Uh, you know, you got, if, you're paying for, if you're paying these guys for anything and they can't get this, then what are you paying for? AutoZone on Tuesday, uh, Wednesday, Micron sent us, uh, well, two different, Micron and sent us Micron. Uh, uh, the reading that I've done, or at least the headlines I've seen uh, on this one that, I, that, that have crossed my eyes, uh, is to not look for anything good out of uh, our memory, memory company here. Uh, Thursday, Accenture, CarMax, Costco, and Jabil. Costco, uh, we have been doing in financial modeling, we have been doing Costco, uh, and tomorrow uh, you'll get the revenue schedule, uh, membership revenue and merchandise revenue. We forecasted those, and in forecasting membership uh, revenue, we forecasted the deferred membership revenue on the balance sheet and merchandise. We've uh, calculated the accrued rewards on the balance sheet. So we got two income statement items done, two balance sheet items done. Our look back period was 2019 to 2023, and we are uh, forecasting uh, for 2024. Well, we get that on uh, Thursday. Uh, so we'll be able to, to see uh, how well we did on membership and merchandise uh, revenue on our forecast and how well we did on deferred revenue and a, uh, accrued member rewards on our balance sheet. 
Uh, and if there's any adjustments that we need to do, we can do them because that is what you do when you get newer results, quarterly results, annual results. The analyst goes back to their assumptions and they say, well, okay, this is, uh, I was a little aggressive here. I wasn't aggressive enough there. Let's change this number here. And you make tweaks uh, because you are forecasting going forward with updated information. And then you hand that to the analyst and the analyst changes the model. So uh, for next Monday, we may spend the time revisiting our assumptions and saying, well, how can we learn from uh, newer information? How can we incorporate newer information into our model? Uh, or we may say, you know what? I'm pretty much in the neighborhood. We did pretty good. I don't know. We'll see what happens uh, when Costco reports. Uh, and then Friday, you have uh, uh, Sherwin-Williams. So this is uh, where we are. Uh, we are in a rate cutting cycle <clears throat> and when you're in a rate cutting cycle you usually want to think about exposure to equities but typically when you're in a rate cutting cycle it's usually because the uh, market has already turned down well before the rate cutting has started because the stock market is a discounting mechanism it foresees a downturn or it foresees a slowdown and then something happens which causes the Fed to cut rates something significant that affects usually the full employment part of its mandate. Uh, and then you have rate cutting cycle into bad economic news, but stock markets typically rally at that point, but usually from lower multiples because their multiple had been declining to some point. But here, uh, the market had not been declining into the first rate cut. It had basically been increasing into the first rate cut, and then you get the rate cut and it increases even more. We are by all measures overvalued. I showed you a bunch of measures last week that showed the uh, uh, so a whole bunch of ways that you can measure the valuation of the market on a relative basis and it was overvalued on all the measures that you could do. So yeah, rents have dropped 5% but housing prices are up 10%, that's your choice. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, rents have increased 5% but housing prices are up 5%, that's your choice. You can either continue renting at a higher price or pay even more to get into a house. Uh, that's your money market. Uh, equity decision is like I can get out of money markets but I'm just going to pay more for the equity market so if we think uh, the four you know at this multiple let me just get some real estate space here uh, uh, how the earnings would look let's say that uh, we're looking at uh, here's where we are here's a timeline and you're saying uh, that you have some kind of three-year forecast for where the S&P is going to be uh, uh, and that gives you some kind of return uh, for it if the multiple is elevated, uh, you basically have a lower return going forward on equities based on some future valuation that you may have for the market. The more you pay for it today, kind of like a bond, if it matures at 100, and if you pay 90 versus 95 versus 99, you're paying 99, yeah, the price has gone up, hitting all-time highs, but how much more potential do you have left in it? Uh, and, uh, you know, if you're thinking about a, a mean reversion back to an equity risk premium that makes sense, there isn't that much upside to markets from where, from where we are. Uh, these are large cap, large cap stocks. You might think, well, maybe small cap stocks. I would probably side with you there saying if, if any uh, uh, market is going to feel a greater benefit from rate cuts, it would be small cap stocks. But... You know, what's the economic environment look like for small cap stocks? If I had to bet now, large cap, small cap, I guess I would lean to small cap for the next uh, for the next couple of quarters. But overall, if I had to bet, I'd be betting big on duration and gold. Um, and not so much on the market itself. If I had to be in equities, I would, uh, you know, uh, repeat the, that neat little um, a catchphrase that you've heard before, we do not have a stock market, we have a market of stocks. I don't know that I would buy SPY, but I would say, you know what, there are some stocks that I would be interested in. Uh, I have been in utilities for a while, I have been in uh, REITs for a while, I'm now in Canadian banks, uh, which I find interesting. There are winners out there to, to be had, um, and uh, let's not forget telecom. AT&T was a, a good call, and uh, I'm looking at Bell. Bell is looking uh, pretty interesting based on their asset sales and, and their debt reduction that they're looking at getting done, uh, and their fiber. 
uh, looking really interesting. So there are places to be, uh, but I just don't know that buying the market as a whole makes a lot of sense for me. I would not be a buyer of SPY. Even if I wanted passive exposure, I would find something else, but I wouldn't be a buyer of SPY. I think you can do better uh, by hunting uh, for stocks. I don't think this is a good macro environment to trade in, but I think it's a good micro environment to trade in. But uh, hammer to the head, coma for 10 years. <clears throat> I've got three minutes to decide what to be in. I would say give me 80% uh, duration, 20% gold, and uh, I'll see you in 10 years. Um, that's it. Um, I'm in Costa Rica now, so my live event, well, for you guys, it'll still be the same time. For me, it's two hours earlier. It'll be 5.15, which is the same time for all of you guys. It's 7.15 uh, Eastern time, or if you think better in geography, Toronto, New York, Miami time is uh, uh, 7.15. Costa Rican time, 5.15. That's it.